Well guys, the last time I put one of these videos out, I said I wanted to wait till there were a few more survival horror games in the works before I did another one, and while I expected a couple of projects to pop up here or there, I never would have assumed I'd essentially be swimming in them at this point. In fact, I would say this video right here is the most densely packed with absolute powerhouse titles collection I've ever put out before. Nearly every single game I'm about to cover has me losing my mind with anticipation. The only downside being, they're just about all demos for games that, at the time of making this video, have yet to be released, which is a little different from previous RE clone collections, but hey, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. It kind of makes my job a little more efficient, actually. We'll also be including a few titles that can only be found on itch.io, a resource that I don't really think I've dipped into much here on the channel. But with all that being said, we should probably get to diving into this ocean of new survival horror titles. What's up guys, I'm Jared, and this is Avalanche Reviews. Damn it. The storm up above must be disrupting their communications. Well, whatever. The show must go on. Endless Blue is something that immediately caught my eye. It is admittedly offering similar survival horror gameplay to every other game on this list, but its presentation really sets it apart, even among other low-poly titles. If the internet's to be believed, it was made during a horror-themed game jam, and I'm hoping we get to see something that approaches an actual final release because it's gotten me pumped. According to Endless Blue's itch.io page, its developers were targeting the PS2 for its look, but honestly it reminds me more of the Dreamcast or maybe some late 90s PC games. I mean, come on. Relatively smooth and sharp 3D geometry with low-res, unanimated 2D textures wrapped across. It's a dead match for that pre-PS2 era. Either way though, it looks absolutely amazing to my eye. Now I am going to have to hurry this section up a bit because the entire demo can be beaten in a matter of 10 minutes, so I don't exactly have a lot of footage to work with, but from what I can tell, the slim amount of story here has my ears perked. You play as Reyna, some kind of an agent sent in to infiltrate an underwater research base. We're not quite sure what she's trying to accomplish there, but there's not exactly anyone around to stop her regardless. As you probably expect with a game like this, some sort of an accident has caused an outbreak turning inhabitants into… whatever this is. What the hell? What I really liked about this demo, outside of its killer soundtrack, are the cool lighting and post-processing effects. Both Reyna and the environment around her are relatively simplistic in terms of design and geometry, but the more realistic looking lighting, instead of creating some kind of a dissonance, just adds to the atmosphere and makes it impressive even in its primitiveness. It also makes use of camera effects like depth of field to a very cool degree, which to those of you who aren't in the know is what's happening here when Reyna blurs as she gets closer to the camera and then comes into sharper focus as she moves towards the obvious focal point off in the distance. Oh, and call me crazy, but I'm pretty sure they're using text to speech for the dialogue here, which if I am being honest is only just barely worse than old Resident Evil voice acting anyways. You want me to swim over there and take on God knows how many of those monsters? I'll try to explain best as I can, but please you must come quickly. Alright, listen guys, competition in this video is going to be pretty damn stiff. There are some absolute showcases of talent that I'm going to be including, and Endless Blue, in my opinion, is swinging with the best of them. It may not be very long, but it tells me everything I need to know about what a full version of this game would be like. I'll make sure to have a link for this and everything we talk about moving forward down in a pinned comment, and I can't recommend enough you guys play this thing. It's incredibly impressive and pretty unique in its presentation, plus it's got easily one of the best credit screens I've ever seen before. I've been following Holston's progress on Twitter for a long time now, and looking at it, you can probably figure out why. 
You guys know I'm a sucker for an interesting presentation and obviously that's exactly what we're dealing with here. The perspective is really damn cool with it acting like a bit of a hybrid between isometric and slightly angled top down. You can control the camera by degrees and to be totally honest with you, I haven't quite figured out whether or not this is all 2D assets changing their orientation with the camera turns, really low resolution 3D or I don't know voxels or something. Either way though, what you're looking at right now is pure beauty as far as I'm concerned. At the moment, we don't exactly have a long demo to judge this upcoming game by, but instead a nice play area to show off what the team is looking to deliver. While there's no combat included here in the playtest build, I have talked to one of the devs and in the full release you'll definitely see some survival horror style shooting, which is nice. What is playable here though is a small explorable house that seems to have been created specifically for the demo. You show up at the Janoski residence looking for someone and in Silent Hill fashion getting info from NPCs will leave you more confused than had you have never talked to them. Jesus Maria Tomusz, wystraszyłeś mnie. Słyszałam jakieś hałasy, ale nie wiedziałam, że to ty. Everyone seems to have lost their damn mind and the place is covered in a strange alien fungus that has an aversion to light. Something you might be able to take advantage of if this kid right here hadn't have snatched all the fuses from the breaker and smashed most of the light bulbs. So for most of this demo, you'll be figuring out how to efficiently move around the house while manipulating the scant amount of light sources you have available to you. For example, if there's an area shaded by some furniture or a bookshelf or something, you need to find out how to shine some light over there. And like any good survival horror game, that means hunting for items, solving puzzles, and unlocking shortcuts through the environment. Controls here work sort of like they would in a top-down game, which ensures they stay the same even when the camera's orientation changes. I played this demo with an Xbox Series X controller and everything felt like it was made to be experienced that way. The only thing I slightly struggled with was the camera rotation not being reversed, but there's an option for that which makes it feel so much better. It seems like the inventory is technically limited, although you won't be able to fill it up here in this demo. I'm not sure if they plan on taking advantage of that in the traditional survival horror sense with the full release, but let's all hope that's the case. Every room you walk into here in the Janoski house is beautifully populated with detail. Little things like toys, glasses, or picture frames have physics so you can knock stuff over when you run by and this mixed with a low volume background music makes for a very immersive kind of environment. It might take you maybe half an hour to get through this playtest build and while I would love to play more of it, what is here gives you a solid idea of how the core of the game is going to work and that has me very excited. So far, it's using item hunting, backtracking, puzzle solving, and good old survival horror intuition really well. It's a tiny slice of gameplay for sure, but it is more than enough to get my mouth watering for what's to come. In my mind, Holston is shaping up to be a killer entry in this new modern survival horror trend. You guys know I tend to prefer the classic style of the genre with its presentation and gameplay following closely to that of the Resident Evil games that created it, but you can't deny how awesome this game looks and once you play it, how great it feels. Trust me, you guys are going to want to keep your eyes on this one. As I write this script, the playtest build is public so you can head to Steam right now and try it out for yourself and that's precisely what I recommend you do. This is an incredibly unique take on survival horror and the last thing I want is for the creativity and obvious good taste these guys have leading to anything other than the abject success and recognition they deserve. Must be pretty boring around these parts. <laughs> you would be surprised. Some things happen out here folks wouldn't believe. Cannibal abduction is part of what I'm seeing as a new arm of the survival horror genre that aims to recreate that schlocky, creepy feel of low-budget slasher flicks and I'm totally okay with that. And right off the bat, the game has a few selling points specifically in my mind and that's a logo design that comes dangerously close to that of Cannibal Corpse and a main character that's rocking a DRI shirt. 
I'd say so far so good. The game starts out with our main character Henry who has borrowed his dad's car and is driving through farm country when the thing just up and stops on him. Soon after, a seemingly nice guy with a beard happens upon him and offers to fix his car in exchange for Henry agreeing to fix an old cabinet at his house that his wife has been nagging him about. Which is an odd trade since I would imagine most mechanics wouldn't exactly see simple carpentry as being too outside of their comfort zone but hey, this guy's only got one arm. Let's do the horror movie thing and give him the benefit of the doubt. And that's exactly what our main character does. After spending a little bit of time on the piece of furniture and not fixing it at all, might I add, we use the sun beginning to go down as a sign to wrap things up, which is when we find out the old man has locked us in. All right, so things are starting to get nice and creepy. After jimmying the lock with a bobby pin, we find a note supposedly left for someone else by the old guy saying that Henry was locked in the room and not to play with the food. Okay, so we have been abducted and there does seem to be a bit of cannibalism going on here. I'd say that's 100% accuracy as far as the game's title goes. From here, we're able to explore the place we're stuck in and it's a pretty classic survival horror style environment. Old creepy house with loads of locked doors, dripping pipes, and secret rooms. It certainly checks all the boxes. The gameplay at this point is split into two main ideas. One, find items and puzzle pieces in order to make progress, and two, avoid this nightmare of an enemy. Which means this game does sort of end up on a side of the spectrum I typically don't get into too much, specifically the persistent, unkillable stalker classification. That being said, I am an open-minded enough guy, and even I can admit having this hooded freak show up swinging a cleaver around and having to rush and find a hiding spot can have a reliable heart rate spiking effect. I would say the method by which he spawns does seem to tread that thin line between annoying and unexpectedly random. Sometimes he'll just be chilling in a room and you'll walk in on him and sometimes he's creepily making his way somewhere and you'll end up crossing his path. I mean it can get slightly frustrating when I've just grabbed a new key and just before I get to the puzzle where it's needed this member of Death Clock's entourage shows up forcing me to lose all that progress and find the nearest hiding spot. Although I will say, what saves this from being drastically more bothersome is how perfectly sized the playable environment is. This house really only has a handful of rooms for you to explore, and it seems like you're never too far from a safe spot when you're getting chased. What does hinder that process, though, is the fact that the tank controls can be a little unwieldy. The run speed seems a little too fast for the area you'll be sprinting through, which is unnecessary when you can't technically outwalk the bad guy, but the bigger issue is the turn speed, or I guess pivot speed, being a little too fast. I found myself overturning when trying to take corners a lot. It just sort of felt like there was a disparity between how I handled with the up and down directions compared to pivoting left or right, which made for a little bit of awkwardness. It wasn't necessarily awful, but it definitely did bother me. And on that note, something that really got on my nerves was the VHS tape damage effect that overlays on the screen. Honestly, I really get the aesthetic they're going for. I've seen this kind of look work really well in stuff like Murder House, and to be fair, the graininess and chromatic aberrations in Cannibal Abduction do a good job of obscuring the low-res textures in 3D models. I'm sure the game would look far more simple and way less interesting without the old VHS look, but the static has a tendency of obscuring things in the environment. A few different times, this would have me missing hiding spots because I would need to shut off my flashlight so the bad guy wouldn't see it, and the dark screen covered in tape damage made for one hell of a time looking for a blob of square darkness in roughly the shape of a wardrobe. That being said, I really liked Cannibal Abduction for what it is. It's an incredibly short game that tells a honestly complete tale, and at a price point of just five bucks, you really can't ask for much more. There's also a secret ending available that should be relatively simple to trigger for those of you who are harshly familiar with the survival horror tactic of making sure every single interactable object has been checked and every puzzle solved. So as long as you know what you're in for, you're guaranteed a good hour or so of fun out of this one, and I think for some of you that might scratch an itch. It certainly did for me. There really aren't a whole lot of games that accurately recreate that grunge and heart you would find in old crappy slasher movies, so when one comes around that's able to do it in a way that calls back to classic RE-style gameplay, I'd say that's worth taking note of.
Echoes of the Living is a project I've been interested in for a very long time now, and not too long before starting this video, its developer Moonglint finally put out a demo, and to say it's promising would be the understatement of the century. This little taste test doesn't include any story, so it'll be easy to jump straight into how it plays, but even that's a pretty short discussion. Remember that classic survival horror gameplay seen in Resident Evils 1, 2, 3, and Code Veronica? Well, it's that. Plain and simple, pretty easy to sum up. It's essentially just classic survival horror gameplay. I love it. You know, oftentimes in modern survival horror, there's a tendency to move away from RE and alter the small details of the genre with the intention of freshening up the experience, and that certainly is something I like seeing. Titles like Alyssa, Signalis, Holston, and Conscript definitely do a lot to add a little spice to the recipe that is classic RE-style gameplay, but every once in a while you want that 100% pure dose. Tank controls, item hunting, a city overrun with the walking dead, and aiming up to pop heads with shotguns. The real stuff. Well, allow me to introduce you to Echoes of the Living, an indie game looking to accurately recreate that entire experience with an impressive amount of detail. Starting off, we've got a great intro sequence similar to RE2 which will have you running through the after effects of a zombie outbreak till you come across a bar where you can explore for items and possible ways out of this mess. Right off the bat, I noticed that the controls here feel very tight and responsive. And you know, people like to shit on tank controls to no end, but I'll die on the hill that they can be amazingly intuitive and very useful in games with fixed camera angles. But they can be kind of tough to tune well and get them feeling perfect. You know, many of the games I've covered in these videos have gotten very close, but if we're going to use Resident Evil as a benchmark, which, let's be honest, with this channel we always are, ETL has some of the best I've come across. And as a little icing on that cake, the 180 quick turn is activated in the expected method, hitting run and down on the D-pad at the same time. Honestly, every time I start up one of these RE clones, that's the first thing I check for. I mean, it's not the most important thing a game can have, but... I don't know, it's always a good sign in my eyes. Anyways, getting back on track, the first section you can actually explore after escaping the bulk of the zombie invasion is this bar, and even though there's probably less than 10 rooms in the entire area, I knew before I'd entered three of them that this was going to be a survival horror game through and through. Static camera angles, puzzle solving, item hunting, backtracking, inventory management, it's all here, literally all of it. I mean, name something you liked about the 90s Resident Evil games, and I promise you, it's present here in this demo. So needless to say, it made a very good impression on me very fast. After you get your hands on a gun, you'll find combat works in the traditional method that you'd be expecting, and that's good because that's exactly how I like it to work. But after you make your way out of the bar, down to the sewers, and back up to the streets, you'll find yourself in a very clear homage to RE3, which seems to be fan service included just for this demo. To be honest though, if it finds its way into the final release, I'm not exactly going to mind. And really, a lot of the following sections are going to give you that same nemesis energy. There are a few more spots that were clearly made as references to similar areas in 3, but aside from that, the general layout here just feels a lot like that game's rendition of Raccoon City's streets. And honestly, that's a big plus for me. Well, not the RE3 part, although that is very cool, but I'm more talking about the whole streets thing. Now don't get me wrong, a spooky mansion is always going to be an automatic win, but I really like it when these types of games are set in recognizably modern locations. I really could not explain why, but seeing desolated streets, overturned cars, and barricaded windows just does something for me. There's something about a zombie outbreak story taking place in a major city that just pulls on some weird strings in my head. But that's kind of just a me thing, very subjective. I will say more objectively though, don't go into this demo expecting a quick in and out type of experience. This thing is going to go on much longer than you might expect. I really mean it when I say there were like three different times when I out loud said to myself, okay, this has to be where they're going to end it. And trust me, that was not a downside. I was loving every minute of Echoes of the Living. I mean, look at it. It's unapologetically survival horror. It checks just about every box I would have wanted, and surprisingly, that's something that doesn't happen a lot in this video series. And I very much need to comment on how damn good these environments look. Now, they're not pre-rendered, but instead fully 3D, but it has gotten to the point where the two are nearly indistinguishable from each other. Either way, though, I genuinely am in love with these backdrops. 
Now I will admit there were maybe one or two spots where I would say things are a little more barren and less detailed than the rest, but as a whole, these backgrounds are surprisingly impressive. Alright, so you may have noticed I've been overly positive here, and believe me, Echoes of the Living deserves every bit of the praise I've been giving it so far, but some of you may have also noticed it can be a little rough around the edges. And since I showered it with compliments, I think it's only fair that I point out some of those aforementioned rough edges. Before I do though, I want to say this is a single person developer. I couldn't imagine the amount of work one person would have to go through in order to do all of this stuff, let alone a full team, so I don't want this to come across as me being a dick. But instead, maybe think about it as me pointing out areas that can be approved on in a product I genuinely want to do well. And that being the case, the first issue most people are probably going to notice is the texture pop-in. In the character select screen, it can take several seconds for the road texture to load in and the intro of the game has a similar issue. To balance that out though, I think these two and maybe one more screen were the only places I really noticed this was going on, so this cloud does have a bit of a silver lining. Now I will admit this next one might just be me, but for some reason I just couldn't get used to the fact that the run button wasn't also the cancel button. I mean, it is sometimes, but in the menu specifically, only Triangle or Y would exit out of it. Honestly, I think it's just Resident Evil muscle memory, but this really messed with me, and the entire runtime I was pressing B to get out of my inventory and a second later remembering, oh yeah, it's Y. I also found a few inconsistencies with how keys are used. 99% of the time they're used automatically when you examine a door that needs them, like in Resident Evil, but on a few doors this didn't happen and I needed to go in and manually use them from the inventory. To be fair, either of these methods would be fine with me, just maybe not both simultaneously in the same game. I also found the ragdolling to be a little too, I guess, aggressive sometimes. When a zombie dies, the ragdoll physics can make for a pretty convincing effect, but sometimes they just collapse into themselves in a janky kind of way. It seems to me like the best results come from when the zombie has some sort of momentum going, so a shot knocking them back before the last blow gets dealt, or if they were lunging forward before they died. I did come across the odd visual bug, but what really bothered me is what seems like a full screen, over sharpened post processing effect that can interact with the game's film grain and make for crawling edges in areas with a lot of tightly packed small details. I also found an issue that was rare, but sometimes environment textures can turn white for just a few frames right after the camera angle changes. All of these problems, though small on their own, can definitely come together and slightly sour what is an otherwise awesome little package. Do keep in mind though, this is a demo and not a finished product. From what I've seen, Moonglint is listening to the people who play this thing and I've got no doubt in my mind it can address most of what I've listed here. And believe me when I say when the full game drops, I'm going to be the first in line to grab it to make sure that's the case. This thing is just flat out oddly refreshing. Even in a list of games in this video looking to recreate a similar style, Echoes of the Living does a notably amazing job at taking that Resident Evil experience and just injecting it straight into your veins. It seems to me this developer really understands what makes survival horror work as a genre, and they're applying every trick imaginable to create something that believably could have just been some cancelled late 90s RE clone. I am beyond excited to see what other classic horror goodness this game's got waiting for me with its full release, but real quick I have to ask a question. Is this a crowbar reference? Because if it is, forget all my complaints before. Go ahead and put this thing down as a 10 out of 10. You know, coming into a video like this is sort of exciting because you never really know what you're going to get outside of the general theme of survival horror, and I'll say I'm not really sure what I was expecting from Simulacrum, but it managed to really surprise me anyways. As the game first starts, we get a glimpse at what seems to be a pretty normal life. Our protagonist wakes up in her apartment and hears her cat scratching at the door. When she tries to let it out, she notices her doorknob is missing and at the same time she realizes a painting on her wall has been replaced. And next thing we know, we're stuck somewhere resembling Silent Hill's other world, which is actually kind of fitting because graphical rough spots aside, this thing right here may as well be some kind of a lost chapter from SH3. I mean it's uncanny, the look of your environment, religious imagery and themes, the color palette, puzzles, it even controls like a Silent Hill title. 
well except for the lack of a quick turn which believe me is sorely missed. You'll be running around this rusted sheet metal and chain link paradise trying to figure out how to get back home and in the process you'll need to solve some genuinely tough puzzles. These things can be insanely tricky if you're not taking in every bit of info coming your way and of course the old strategy of trying to use every item on everything you see. I also noticed that as I played, the map fills itself in when areas or objects of interest are found, and I know I already said this, but I mean, this is just flat out Silent Hill. It's not a well-made homage, but instead it feels like a one-to-one -one copy. And that might sound like an insult, but it takes a lot of knowledge and skill to pull something like this off. You really have to have a deep-rooted love for your source material, and after spending about two hours playing chapter one of this thing, I have no doubt that's exactly the kind of admiration this project was born from. The music is also clearly looking to emulate that Akira Yamaoka sound, and while it would be hard for anyone to top that man's list of absolute survival horror sound design gold, some of these tracks get pretty damn close. The focus is a very clear mix of ambient soundscapes punctuated by more industrial elements, and I'm always going to like that specific combination no matter who's behind it. The environment the game takes place in does an amazing job of straddling that clear line between a dark, chaotic, Jacob's Ladder nightmare scene and your more recognizable visual themes, which in my opinion makes the feeling of dread and isolation all the more effective. Of course, being surrounded by a cult, religious, and undecipherable iconography also makes sure you're always stuck in limbo between not knowing what the hell's going on here, but having an inkling whatever it is it's not good. I've always enjoyed that approach, and unsurprisingly, it's one that Team Silent excelled at. In SH games, you were always being shown just enough to get your imagination to kick in, filling in a lot of psychological blanks, and I think that made for a horror experience that even a team of incredibly skilled developers and artists could never even get close to. After all, what scares man more than the contents of his own psyche, right? I think the horror game sector is running a little light on approaches like this lately. People often go too far into that gross-out territory or trap a game's meaning behind so many walls of vagueness it's effectively inaccessible. Rarely do you see something that slots right into the middle of that spectrum and I think that makes Simulacrum really special. It creates this space that's both spooky and disturbing but on a deeper level and it also makes you curious enough to want to see more of it. That's really a lost art in my opinion. However, it's not a perfect production, obviously. I feel like handling is a little too slow and unresponsive sometimes. Luckily there is no combat in this chapter so I don't have to worry about dodging enemies but at first I really struggled with taking turns and navigating well. When I stopped using the d-pad and started using the analog stick a lot of these issues cleared up but even then it still felt like I was just barely able to do what I wanted with the controls. And of course with a lower budget title you're not going to expect graphical perfection so I can let these weird ass ponytails slide but it is a little weird that our heroine is constantly stuck with a face that resembles a reddit atheist about to type citation needed into a comment section. And honestly, I would really love to see some actual Silent Hill style combat included. Don't get me wrong, this developer absolutely nailed the exploration, item hunting, and puzzle solving of the genre, but leaving out the combat or sense of danger sort of leaves it feeling, I don't know, maybe incomplete. Hopefully in chapter 2, which does seem to be an active development, we can see some kind of higher stakes, but even if there isn't, this was still a really damn interesting playthrough. If you're a fan of Silent Hill and you're as sure as I am that the new SH2 remake is going to shit the bed as far as survival horror gameplay goes, this might be one of your last options. So I would say go ahead and clear maybe 2 hours from your schedule and try out one of the absolute best Silent Hill inspired games I may have ever played before. But how did you manage to get here? Didn't you want me to follow you? That was not the question. The Pale is another short demo from itch.io and another really interesting setup. You play as Arthur, a new lighthouse keeper heading to an island off of Maine called, well, The Pale. You're here to replace the guy who used to work this beat thanks to him being hospitalized with chest pains. It seems like this island used to be home to a fishing village that dried up eventually and for about 15 years now it's been abandoned. When you first step foot on the island, the atmosphere is thick and oppressive just like I like it. There are abandoned buildings to explore and your flashlight just barely illuminates the space directly in front of your character. 
in these first few moments, I also noticed that a lot of the demo is silent as far as music goes, opting for ambient sound effects instead, which I think adds to the atmosphere. Before Arthur can get to bed, he's got to turn on the generator and get the lighthouse running. In the process, he ends up messing with a control panel of sorts and... Well, the result is sort of a mystery. It looks like he frees some kind of a giant Lovecraftian nightmare, but you never really see what the hell is on the other end of this massive chain and what seems to be a collar. After that, you radio your contact and let them know things are up and running, of course deciding to leave out the part where you may have released an eldritch horror onto the world, and she lets you know that the keeper you've been sent out to replace just died in the hospital, which is a real bummer, but Arthur beds down for the night and when he wakes up he finds a storm headed his way. In the process of battening down the hatches and preparing for the oncoming gale, he comes across what looks like a skinned dead body on the beach. Obviously, his first reaction is to radio the mainland, but when his radio breaks, he's got to gather the tools to fix it. In doing so, he crosses paths with that dead body again, only it's made some friends in the meantime. At this point, an insane amount of skinless bodies are now on the beach, making things somehow more dire than they were before. After sort of getting in touch with his ride, she tells him to meet her at the docks, but just then the power goes out and we hear the sound of glass breaking, which I've noticed never precedes anything good. Well, it turns out those skinless corpses weren't as corpse-like as we originally thought. After putting that abomination down, Arthur heads towards the docks, but we find out the island is now crawling with these things and fighting them is not exactly an option. So instead, he tries to outrun them until they crowd him on a bridge. A bridge that wasn't exactly in the best condition to start with. So the thing eventually snaps and that's where our demo ends. According to the developer, the final version of this game is going to release sometime this year, which is great, but this little teaser does a lot of things right. The mystery of the island, the feeling of isolation, and the use of unseen horrors, it really has a lot going for it for such a short demo that includes not as much gameplay as you might expect. On its itch.io page, the developer says it's an hour long demo, but I got through it in maybe 30 minutes, so there might be some stuff I failed to do, but either way, I really like what I'm seeing here. Sadly, this is yet another indie horror game that forgoes the D-pad for analog stick-based tank controls, something that never feels quite right. But movement and turning speed are all pretty tight, so things are definitely better than they could be. I'll tell you one thing, this running animation most definitely reminds me of old early 90s CG renders, which is sort of funny, but it also kind of adds to the charm here. Speaking of which, this is yet another game going for that PS1 style aesthetic, but again, it looks more to me like early PC game low poly graphics. I'm definitely not complaining though. To me, there's something about the use of simplistic graphics to approximate realistic locations that really helps sell a horror atmosphere. I can't exactly explain it. I don't know, maybe there's some kind of dissonance going on, but either way, I really like it. This may be a very, very short teaser of what's to come, but if this developer can keep up even a portion of this atmosphere and dread, we have one amazingly fun RE clone on our hands. You know, my travelers stay that night and knock them out cold. They wake up with whiskers and a tail, and a long desire to shit in a box. I know what you're talking about. That got shut down and turned into a tourist resort. I stayed there last March. Did I make a good Benedict? This one I've had my sights fixed on for a while now. I first came across Prototype Mansion before it was available on Steam. It had caught my eye with the reputation it had built, but I'd say more than anything, it was the look that drew me in. A look that, if I'm being honest, sort of wore out its welcome pretty early on for me. I mean, this is a cool idea on paper, but I think a lot of these PS1 style games tend to focus really hard on making the in-game graphics look worse in order to get across the feeling that they're old. But there was a genuine process behind how the PS1 rendered 3D graphics and I feel like no one actually tries to replicate that. Instead, they just severely lower the internal render resolution and throw a CRT display option in there. Oh, and by the way, don't use that in this game. It's way too blurry. It genuinely hurt my eyes after a while. 
Anyways, the game looks okay enough in motion, but when things come to a stop, immediately you notice the aliasing gets way worse. Like, the model's resolution gets cut in half, and when your character is too far from the camera, they scale to like four on-screen pixels. I know all that sounds a bit harsh, but there's a lot I like about this game's presentation. It just so happens to be doing something I see in a lot of these indie titles, and this is just the section of the video I decided to unload all that. Well, continuing on, when I started Prototype Mansion up, I got the immediate feeling that this game exists somewhere between a parody and homage. It definitely plays a lot like an old survival horror game, with the only big difference being regular third-person controls as opposed to tank controls, which, I'll be honest, did take me a while to get used to. Besides that, though, it feels like a fun, if rudimentary, example of the genre. The whole parody thing comes into play with how much the game is dedicated to comedy comedy that I'm happy to say is actually kind of funny. Nearly every scene is a spoof of some kind of genre trope, and even your actions in-game can have a comedic effect. Like that time I busted into a room blasting a zombie but fired one extra bullet as it went down, and that extra round just so happened to explode a nearby cat. I didn't notice any puzzles in the game, but collecting items and backtracking do seem to make up the lion's share of exploration, and it's pretty damn tough in terms of avoiding damage and conserving ammo. I had to restart a few times because I either died or got to a point where I ran completely dry on resources. And I would love to tell you more, but this game crashed on me five or six times over the course of making this video, and since the game saves at specific progress checks, I kept having to replay the same sections over and over again. After that last crash, I sort of washed my hands of the thing. I honestly would have loved to have played more because I had just started getting an idea for how the game was wanting me to play so I could hold on to as much ammo as I could, but I guess it is what it is. Luckily though, this same developer made another survival horror game that's available on Steam, so let's check that one out and hope it salvages my crushed hopes. And if there's one thing I can say about Jupiter Lighthouse's next game, Garden Variety Body Horror, it's that it's definitely a more refined, less slapdash version of Prototype Mansion. Movement isn't quite so fast and floaty, combat is way better, and the area the game takes place in is much bigger and more, I don't know, intelligently laid out. Adding to the options screen, we've got a few different well, options, including a much improved CRT filter, but more importantly, an option for a 480p VGA mode, which seems to double the amount of on-screen pixels. And this right here is what I call a happy medium between getting across that low-poly, low-res look, but also providing a nice-looking and visually understandable picture. Now, from what I gather, this is supposed to be a sequel to the last game, and as such, you'll be taking on the other half of the team this time. All around, it feels like a much more complex and, I guess, more full experience, which is really nice. We've got the same non-tank controlled system, but this time, instead of a more fixed perspective, the camera follows pretty close to Hank, kind of like a third-person shooter. In moments when that's not the case, you can hold L1 to orient it behind him, but this is a really slow process and can be sort of unreliable sometimes. On the opposite side of that coin, I found this very cool mechanic where you can either use cans of tuna to feed stray cats, which acts as a save point, or you can consume it to gain back health. Tying such a limited resource to two different functions is kind of cool and a welcome change to your normal survival horror orthodoxy. Now I'm front loading all of these compliments because, well to be honest, I really really want to like this game. Its humor is honestly really funny, and they even made the voiceover Japanese to give it a sort of PS1 game so low budget they didn't even bother translating it kind of feel, but I just was not having fun past the first, I don't know, 20 minutes or so. I think my biggest issue here is the fact that it has to be played in this very hyper-specific order, otherwise you can make the experience significantly more difficult for yourself. Items like ammo and weapons are hidden a little too well in my opinion, and that goes double for necessary paths that you need to take to move forward. Like I said, you can play this game in a way that makes things much harder for you, and there are these odd decisions like these boxes here that can act as RE-style item chests, which is actually kind of great. 
and even better, you need to slot fuses into them to open them up, and there aren't many of those just lying around, so you might have to take some fuses from a fuse box, which means making once lit areas dark. Once you spend a fuse, it breaks forever, but you get access to that box forever, and all the items you put in it are available in any other boxes you decide to open. So where's the problem here? Well, if you're like me, you may have tried avoiding opening some of these for that very reason, opting instead to have only a few open, making it a little harder in terms of backtracking, but at least you're not spending precious resources, right? Well, if you do that, you may miss out on a flashlight that sits in your vest pocket, which is something I would say is vital to completing the game. The normal flashlight does the same exact job the other one does, but it has to be unequipped in order to shoot your guns and then re-equipped after a fight, otherwise the environment can be way too dark to actually navigate. There might be 10 more examples like this that can have you essentially softlocking yourself into a much harder game than it has to be. And believe me, this is already a hard enough game as it is. There are enemies that stand dead still till you get within grabbing range, and they're covered in the same stuff the entire game world is, plants and flowers. Add that to these assholes that can one-hit kill you and move faster than you do, and you've got a game where progress needs to be gained through trial and error. You essentially just die and reload till you're familiar with what's to come, or you do what I did and have to restart the game three or so times because you were in an unwinnable situation. For example, if you just so happen to walk into this room, which is totally accessible after you read a paper, without finding the shotgun, which itself is deviously hidden, you're flat out not going to be able to beat this boss. Because not even a survival horror savant would have the handgun ammo needed by this point. I don't know guys, I sort of feel bad about this one, because a really interesting and rewarding survival horror game is staring me right in the face, it's just inches outside of my grasp. I really can tell a lot of the decisions made here were done to spice up the genre's typical gameplay and I can see a lot of them working really well if they weren't in a game that actively fights the player every step of the way. I really got a kick out of the horror and while the game was a little too tongue in cheek for the atmosphere to get too creepy, it definitely tries to get there. Seeing how big of a jump it is going from prototype to garden variety, I'd love to see what Jupiter Lighthouse comes out with next. It seems like maybe all they need is another crack at this formula to really perfect it, but as far as what's here is concerned, it's just a little too adversarial to the player to be much fun, at least for me. I do want to point out that it's pretty common for me to have some weird taste, and I'm not exactly one of those people who actively seeks out difficult video games, so there still might be a chance that this will be something you'll get into. And even though I'm not its biggest fan, the formula and execution-driven nature of this thing makes it feel like the kind of game people who like speedrunning would really get a kick out of. So maybe there's some value here that I'm just not seeing, but as far as I'm concerned, this is more like a lot of potential with two really botched landings. And having said all of that, I really, really don't like being negative in these videos because I do recognize that I do tend to be drawn to some weird stuff. So instead of a, these games are bad, maybe take this as, they're just not for me. Lakehaven Chrysalis is a bit of a preview for the upcoming survival horror title Lakehaven. Like Holston, I'm pretty sure this was just a vertical slice to get people interested in what's to come, and I'd say it most definitely had that effect on me. This is yet another title, chasing that early PS1 3D aesthetic, and out of all the games in this video so far, I'd say this one pulls it off with the most skill. In fact, this might be the best attempt I've ever seen, period. And by the way, this is Jared coming in after the video started being edited, and there's a game coming up that's going to make that statement 100% false, so stay tuned for that, I guess. Like you would expect, this game makes use of low-poly 3D models, but also goes the extra mile with some very accurate dithering, and they even made sure the console's signature affine texture warping looked right on the money. It defaults to a 4x3 aspect ratio, which I will always appreciate, but I think we'll go for 16x9 for this video's sake. 
Video stuff aside, it is very clear that Lake Haven is targeting that Silent Hill style of gameplay. Everything from the font and item pickups, right down to the dithering, seems lifted from Konami's psychological horror masterpiece. And in a world of RE clones, being an SH clone makes you stand out in the best kind of way. There isn't much actual story given at the start, except that you're some kind of detective and you've been given a case that has brought you to this old farmhouse. Inside, we find a dead woman, and from there, the goal is to see exactly what went down here and why. In doing so, you'll deal with the kind of puzzle solving, diary reading, and exploration you would expect from this type of game, and it's all perfectly executed if you ask me. This is a relatively small location, it being a demo and all, but it's packed with key items to find and esoteric actions you're going to need to carry out. As you unlock more of the house and the creepy cult tunnels underneath it, you'll come across the dead woman's diary entries which chronicle what seems to be a battle with onset mental illness and paranoia. Paranoia and mental illness which seems to have driven her husband away and this might hand wave some of the stuff we've discovered so far but it definitely doesn't tackle the issue of the aforementioned Lovecraftian tunnels underneath the house. After maybe 15 minutes of gameplay, things start to hint at a more supernatural sort of undertone, and by the end, those little hints turn into outright screams when things start heading in a very Twin Peaks dream logic sort of direction. You can definitely get the most brief idea of what the finished game's story might be like here with the demo, but if it can set up a mystery, even a portion as interesting as this one, it's going to be pretty damn amazing. I really can't say why, but I kind of like the lack of voice acting here. I'm not really sure if the final game is going to include VA, but I kind of hope it doesn't. I don't know, it just helps with the atmosphere, makes it feel so much more engrossing. There is a single part of Chrysalis that includes combat, and it works about how you'd want it to. And I really gotta say, I like the nods to PT and SH2 in its secret ending. You always love to see easter eggs like this. When the full release of Lake Haven comes out, about the only thing I'd want to see changed are the camera angles, or at least a mechanic tied to the camera angles. This game goes for that familiar SH style, having the camera stay fixed, but follow the player on a set course through certain scenes. The only real exception being, you can't hit a button to fix the camera to your character's back here like you can in SH, and honestly, Chrysalis has some of the most tense and attractive angles I've ever seen in this type of game. Specifically, I really like how the camera gives you this creepy voyeur kind of feeling with how it moves organically, like someone's actually looking at you from that angle. It's really effective. My only problem comes into play when these camera angles are changing from scene to scene. It feels like that changeover is just a little slower than it should be, leading to me seemingly walking off the screen and staying out of view of the camera for a little too long to be comfortable. In the final game, if there's some kind of a threat to look out for, which I assume there will be, I imagine this would lead to a cheap hit or two. It's certainly not the largest problem a video game can suffer from, but it definitely feels to me like the camera transitions last maybe one second too long. Oh, and the CRT filter makes the picture way too soft, but you can toggle that off in the options, so it's a non-issue really. Those two small, if you can call them gripes aside, this is one hell of a promising preview. I've always been a bit of a Silent Hill 1 fanatic, and out of all the attempts that have been made to recreate that game's specific look and feel, this has got to be by far the most accurate. Just like its inspiration, Lake Haven doesn't seem keen on the idea of telling you exactly what's going on here, which very well could come back to bite it in its ass later, but as of now, I'll say these guys have set up an amazingly interesting mystery, and I absolutely can't wait to get my hands on the finished product. <laughs> When I make these RE clone videos, I typically have at least an idea of what I'm getting into. I've either been following the project for a while, or it's something a viewer or a friend has suggested, along with a brief description, but this is a very different story. To be totally honest, I can't really remember what drove me to download the demo for You Will Die Here Tonight, but I can tell you one thing, it has easily become one of the most interesting entries on this list. Yeah. 
Starting it up, we get a very familiar setup. There have been reports of brutal murders and a team of specially trained police have been sent to a huge mansion to bring in the perpetrators. Ringing any bells yet? Trust me though, the homage does not stop there. This Ares division all wear very stars adjacent gear with each member being color coded and having the expected and very necessary shoulder pads. Callbacks to Resident Evil aside, this game bounces back and forth between what seems to be obvious tongue in cheek caricature to some genuinely dark seriousness. This guy right here delivers some of the most personally relatable writing I've ever seen with lines like, my arms are too muscular to reach into this vase and things like this wouldn't happen if butlers were taught self-defense. But then that's juxtaposed to a section where an Ares member suffers through the guilt of losing his daughter while he's on the verge of dying himself. It's kind of all over the place and I think I like it. There's a cool twist at the end of the demo which you could probably argue was at least inspired by Resident Evil and I would say it's pulled off really well. I really like the writing here, I think it matches the actual gameplay to a pretty scary degree. Normally I would say I like my games to take themselves a bit more seriously but I don't know, it just works really well here. Kind of like a cheesy movie that knows how cheesy it really is, so it's got free reign to do the most ridiculous stuff that wouldn't work in a more serious production. Hey, there's a quote for the back of the box. This is the video game equivalent of a Neil Breen movie in all the best ways. Gameplay-wise, we're dealing with a very cool assortment of honestly unique ideas. First off, the general gameplay premise is that you take control of this police squad one member at a time and, at least in this demo, dying is a foregone conclusion. You play each Ares member and get to the point where they're killed somehow and then you unlock the next person in line. Apparently in the game proper, the things you do with one team member can affect the next person you play as, which sounds like a better use of the RE2 zapping system than you can find in RE2 Remake. At least as far as this demo goes, each Ares member seems to act as a sort of tutorial for the different kinds of gameplay you can expect to come up against. Puzzle solving, item hunting, dodging zombies, and of course combat. Speaking of which, when a zombie grabs you or you initiate a fight, you'll be taken to a very Resident Evil Gaiden sort of screen where you can deal with the walking dead in first person. Where Gaiden wanted you to do damage with timing based attacks though, this game has you just plain old first person shooting. Melee attacks seem to be just about as useless as they normally are in an RE game outside of Code Veronica and I'd say that's a good move balance wise in a game that aims to have you conserving ammo but also wants a bit of difficulty. One thing that was pretty novel is the fact that initiating combat while other zombies are nearby will bring them into the fray and they could be anywhere on the playfield so you might have to keep your head on a swivel. This gives the fights a tactical bend that I think is going to be awesome to see in the full release. Speaking of which, it seems to me this is one of those deals where the demo is its own thing separate from the actual finished product and is meant as a vertical slice of what they're trying to accomplish. And if that is indeed the case, color me incredibly interested. I don't know quite how to explain it, but this game just pulls everything off perfectly. Movement, exploration, puzzle solving, combat, it all just feels really tight and well implemented. I did run into the occasional problem like not being able to run out of a door despite it looking like I was perfectly lined up to do so, but you might just chalk that up to the game's nearly isometric perspective. Other than that though, I really don't have anything to complain about. I do however have a lot more stuff to compliment, especially as far as the game's presentation goes. Backgrounds seem to be 2D pre-renders which you know I always love, but in an odd twist so are the characters. It looks like they're using that old Donkey Kong digitized approach by rendering out CG models and bit crushing them down to create animated sprites. Honestly, it's something I didn't really know I wanted to see in a new game till I did here. You can tell they really wanted to sell that look because they certainly could have made the animations more fluid with more frames, or at least I'm assuming they could have, but they chose to keep it choppy and honestly I commend that move. It completes the package in a way and leads to something very interesting. In a fight, things switch to 3D graphics with some really just amazingly fluid animations, only the render resolution is super low, leading to this really satisfying aliasing. It's kind of similar to what you could produce upscaling a really good looking 480p image from the PS2 or GameCube era, or maybe when you run old PC games at modern resolutions. And what I mean by all that is, it's awesome. Both in and out of combat, you can count on a smart use of real-time lighting and other post-processing effects to add that extra bit of atmosphere and overall I just really couldn't be more hyped on how a game looks. 
like I said before, this whole package is not something I would have thought to desire from a video game, but now that I've seen it all working together, I might be in love. You Will Die Here Tonight's demo is relatively short. You could probably blast through it in about half an hour, but it tells a relatively complete, albeit compressed tale that definitely serves the intended purpose. As far as I can see, there's no hard date set for this game's actual release, so if you need me, I'll just be hitting F5 on its Steam page for the foreseeable future. When I first caught a glimpse at Senses Midnight, it looked a little familiar to me, and that's because I had already played its developer Suzaku's other release, Sense, a cyberpunk ghost story, and I kind of liked it. Midnight is a combination of common Japanese horror tropes with a bit of a modern twist. You play as Kaho, and your friend group are into ghosts, specifically researching them. You're at a public park in Ikebukuro investigating some old ghost story that saw some people stumbling upon a woman who had hung herself, which apparently cursed them and the park. Kaho is in the park doing all the legwork, but she's got her friends with her in the sense that they're all in a group chat together. Every time you come across something out of the ordinary or useful, they'll chime in, and this mechanic allows the game to run typical tutorial type stuff by the player without breaking the fourth wall too much. As Kaho comes across the door to the spot where the corpse was supposed to have been found, she ends up activating this park's trap card, and now she's stuck here, surrounded by ghosts and other members of some more common Japanese folklore. Alright, so I'm going to be totally honest with you guys, this game is not my cup of tea right from the start because I tend not to get into Japanese ghost stories too much. I'm not really sure why that is, but there's just something conceptually that doesn't do much for me there. That being said, it is novel having a horror game like this set in a cyberpunk looking future Tokyo. I mean, my house is like 20 minutes away from Ikebukuro and it adds an extra layer of coolness, just not enough to get me over the whole Japanese ghost story thing. Moving on to the gameplay, at first this thing might throw you for a loop. When it starts up and you notice that usable camera in your inventory, you're probably going to think the same thing I did. Obvious fatal frame type direction, right? Well, actually no. You can take pictures of things, and that mechanic is linked to progression and exploration sometimes, but instead of using a camera to hurt the spirits that are after you, Sense is more of a run and hide type of game, and sadly that's another one of my pet peeves. I've never really enjoyed the non-combat approach to horror games, honestly, and because of that I couldn't really tell you if the run and hide mechanics here are any better or worse than the other games that include them, so take any of my criticisms with a grain of salt. When you find a hiding spot, there's a mechanic that lets you hold your breath, but successfully doing so doesn't seem to make the ghost go away, so there were a few times where I'd just be sitting there holding my breath waiting for him to leave, and then eventually I'd just get up and run away with them standing right on top of me. On a more objective level, it would be nice if the items had names or, I don't know, could be examined. You only have four item slots and there were a few times where I'd end up having to drop everything I had found and I wasn't sure what was necessary for any upcoming puzzles. And I think a quick description or some flavor text would definitely solve that problem. Your run speed is also a little too slow for my liking. It seems like just about everything can outrun you, which I assume was the point as far as enemies go, but when exploring the pretty wide open areas of the park, it feels like progress is made at a crawl. <gasps> Alright, so you probably already figured this out, but I just don't think this is the type of game for me. I did however want to make sure it was included in the video because it does satisfy a lot of my requirements for being called an RE clone and if some of you end up liking what you're seeing, you can support the developer and try it out for yourself. It may not be my cup of well-endowed tea, but different strokes for different folks, right? Listen, it is no secret that the quickest way to my heart is to recreate that PS1 graphical aesthetic, and with it being such a hot style nowadays, for the first time in a very long time, people like me are eating well, and well, I'm not planning on going on a diet anytime soon. Speaking of which, Heartworm is a survival horror title from Vincent Adenolfi, 
Sincerely, I hope I said that right. And after spending about half an hour beating its demo, it's joining the long list of upcoming titles that have my day one purchase stamp of approval. As you can see, it's using an incredibly accurate version of what you would see graphically spinning up a PS1 game right now, and what's that, like two modern games on this list that make use of dithering? I'm in heaven, guys. On that note, you can technically disable the dithering if you want, but just know if you do, you'll be hurting me. There's also an option to disable quote-unquote pixelation, which pulls off a look that sort of reminds me of those Bleem discs that would allow you to put PS1 games in your Dreamcast and play them at 480p. Well, I think you guys know me well enough to know which option I'm going to go with, and I'll tell you this right now, this very well may be the best looking game we've talked about all day. I mean, it's obviously well within my wheelhouse, which is always appreciated, but PS1 low poly graphics aside, the camera angles and creative scenery here is just on another level. The use of CRTs everywhere, the creepy dreamlike decorations and analog video static for enemies, it's honestly very unique and truly impressive. As far as the story goes, this is just a short demo, so don't expect too much, but the game starts out with an introduction scene where our main character is talking about how she heard about this place near a power plant where people have been able to cross over to the other side and see the people that they've lost. She vows to check this place out for herself, so as a woman of her word, she heads out there and that's about the only story you're going to get. There are a few notes and journal entries you can find, but most of them pertain to one of the demo's puzzles, and the others are just short messages from people who have come to this place for the same reason as you. After searching around this old abandoned house for a bit, we find a key to the attic, which leads us to this weird MC Escher-esque area, and when we try to leave, whatever the hell this is, make sure that doesn't happen. In order to get away from this guy, our protagonist heads through a door seemingly leading to nowhere and she wakes up in this Nightmare on Elm Street dream sequence where video static people are looking to punch her to death. The goal in this area is to collect three items to slot into a door, which, like the preceding moments, will have you engaging in good old-fashioned survival horror gameplay. You've got a limited inventory, key hunting, backtracking, puzzle solving, combat that can be avoided if you want, and of course exploration. Movement feels incredibly tight and perfectly tuned for the genre, and while the quick turn isn't activated with down and run like I usually like, it is mapped to the L trigger so I'm still a happy camper. The first time I did some initial research into the game for this video, I saw that a camera was being used as a weapon and again I assumed Fatal Frame style mechanics, but when you aim your camera, you essentially essentially switch to an over the shoulder perspective and things play out like they would if you were holding a gun. It's functionally the same thing, but the camera just fits better into this world for some reason. I will say the change to the combat perspective when pressing right trigger can be a little jarring sometimes and there were a few times when it locked onto the wrong orientation. Like right here, I pressed R while facing the enemy, but when the camera zoomed in it turned me around and aimed at the whole lot of nothing behind my character. This wasn't exactly something I could get to happen more than, I don't know, maybe twice, and it only went down in this open area as far as I can tell, so it's nothing to be worried about, but definitely something I think the developer should look into. Since the in-game static entities are relatively slow, they have a projectile that does no damage, but will slow your character down if she gets hit, so dodging them isn't as easy as you might first think. Seems to me like the ones that are inside or in tighter areas don't use this attack, so there's definitely been some purposeful balancing done here. Despite the switch to the over-the-shoulder view, combat here seems to feel more true to the genre, and that goes for just about everything else. It looks like the goal is to conserve the slim amount of resources you come across, and that's all pluses as far as I'm concerned. Music tends to lean towards the more smooth and ambient side of things most of the time, with a heavy emphasis on piano licks, and you're not going to see me complain about that. Like a Silent Hill title, this game knows when to use music and when not to in order to build up an intentional mood, which is a rare skill nowadays. 
There may not be more than maybe half an hour's worth of gameplay to be found in this demo, but I can tell you right now, it paints a perfectly clear picture of what the developer is looking to include in the final version. And that being the case, I am beyond excited to see that thing release. Heartworm seems to be this perfect marriage of the gameplay foundation and style of Resident Evil games, mashed perfectly together with more thought-provoking visual cues meant to instill a subconscious effect. I can't quite put my finger on it, but I get the feeling there's meaning to all this weirdness beyond the trope of girl goes ghost hunting in an abandoned house, which is a combination I wholeheartedly welcome. This thing sounds, feels, and plays like real deal, honest to goodness survival horror, and as far as I'm concerned, me saying that is the same as giving it my full, unadulterated recommendation. So you might as well head on over to Heartworm's Steam page and give the demo a download. If you've come to this channel specifically for this type of video, I've got no issue saying you have a 99.9999% chance of falling in love with it the same way that I have. Well guys, that's about all the survival horror and survival horror adjacent games I could scrape together for the time being. Like I said at the start, this is without a doubt the most banger filled collection to date, so if you found something on the list that tickles your fancy, make sure to give it a shot. These developers are doing us all a service by producing the type of games we've been begging for for years. We just need to do our part, which luckily only requires us to, you know, play them. I hope you guys had a good time with this one because I always get a kick out of getting to sample so many awesome and unique projects. Here's hoping it won't be too long till the industry has built up enough new ones that I can put another one of these videos together for you. Till then though, thanks so much for stopping by. As usual, I'm Jared. I bet we're in for some real astral plane body swapping kind of shit tonight. And this is Avalanche Reviews. Well, hello there. Thank you all very much for spending just a bit of your day with me. I hope you found something in this video that speaks to you, and if that's the case, feel free to support more projects like this one over on Patreon and here by becoming a YouTube partner. It's the generosity of random strangers like yourself that makes sure I'm able to keep creating the videos that I want to make as opposed to the ones that are guaranteed to make the most amount of ad revenue. So for every release of mine that isn't a Minecraft roleplay with a Fortnite graphics mod, you guys are to thank. And you know, I say that as a joke, but I'm almost positive I could find a video like that with two minutes of Googling because we live in hell. I'll see you guys later and have a good one.